again for another opportunity to come into your house and to worship you and to love you and we're privileged and I say that every yes. week almost yes. we are privileged to know your spirit yes, many people do not know the spirit of God Lord. and Father God we are thankful yes. and Lord we do praise you for that spirit yes. of the Holy Spirit yes. and this morning Lord as we speak concerning the Good Shepherd I pray God that your love and your compassion will flow through us, that we would receive the word that you have designated for the church this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I'd like to speak to you on the subject of the Good Shepherd. In John chapter 10, verse 1, I'm going to read two versions. Jesus said, verily, verily, which means pay attention. I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. In John chapter 10, verse 1, in the easy version, it says, Let me set this before you as plainly as I can. If a person climbs over or through the fence of a sheep pen, instead of going through the gate, you know he's up to no good, a sheep rustler. I was sort of perplexed at the verse where the word thief and robber, which I thought were the same, was in the same verse. A thief in the Greek means an embezzler, a cunning crook, a burglar, a rustler, one who steals in a sneaky, sly, crafty, secret, and covert way. Fly under the radar. Can you say that again? I will. A thief is an embezzler, a cunning crook, a burglar, a rustler, one who steals in a sneaky, sly, crafty, secret, and covert way. They fly under the radar, but they steal. A robber is a robber. But the definition is a mugger, a looter, a gangster, a lawbreaker, an outlaw, a felon, one who steals openly, like the thugs of today that we've seen in our cities, as they have broken into stores one after the other to loot and even in broad daylight. So God gives us two meanings here. And he says, watch out for the covert thief that wants to come into your life and steal your faith and everything you have. And watch out for the robber who is blatant in just daylight. Steal a car, mug someone, take someone's pocketbook and run down the road. And we've seen this even in the city where we live. That that has happened. So what's a sheepfold? A sheepfold is an embarkment where the shepherd builds. It's made out of brush, stone, fence. If they had money, the rich people would build bigger and better sheepfolds. But it provided protection during storms and especially at night. And it was built basically to manage the sheep. And Jesus, he wants to be our manager. Amen. And this is what these verses are about. The sheepfold is a separation or a barrier, praise God, from thieves and robbers and animal predators. Say that again. The sheepfold is a separation, and you have to understand that word separation this morning, because it's important. It's a separation or barrier from thieves and robbers and animal predators. Our lives, our homes, and our churches should be a sheepfold that separates us from the world. Amen. Should have said amen. That's what we are. We are a sheepfold. And we should be the barrier. And we should be the separation from the world. In our homes, in our churches, and as we go about our business. But there's something that happens in life. And I call it an intrusion. An intrusion of others. <coughs> Various kinds of people come in and out of our sheepfold. Some are thieves. Some are robbers. None of us are exempt from the intrusion of others. 
What is intrusion? It's the forcing of oneself into a place without right or welcome. We have in our doorsteps, in our homes, most of us, welcome mats. And when someone comes to our door, we say you're welcome. But every once in a while, someone comes to our door and the welcome mat is not for them. That's right. Because we know in our spirit there's just something not right here. Amen. There's just something in our spirit that says, don't even open the door. Yeah. Speak through the door and say, I'm not interested. Thank you. They may have a pamphlet in their hand, a briefcase in their hand. They want to tell you something that, oh, we have this. We're family people. We just want to come into your home for a few minutes. No thank you. Amen. Praise God. This home here, hallelujah, has the blood of Jesus Christ, praise God, shed for it. And as in the Old Testament, when the Jewish people had their barbecue and had roasted their lambs on the hill, God told them to stay in their house, stay in their house, and put the blood on the doorposts of their home. And praise God, no one in their homes died. But over in Egypt, everyone had a death in every family. Why? Because the Spirit of God was with the Jewish people, and the Spirit of God was judgment against the Egyptians because of what they did to the Jewish people. Intrusion happens. Some of these people come into our sheepfold to exploit us and sometimes to abuse us, resulting in us becoming, listen, suspicious and lacking trust concerning other relationships. Listen, if I ask you this question, have you ever been burned? I don't mean burned on the stove. Have you ever been burned in a relationship? And overwhelmingly, every one of us would say yes. So ask yourself this question. What happened to you after you got burned concerning trusting other people? Your trust level went down. That's right. That's right. It did not go up. Right. It did not stay the same. And all of a sudden, the intrusion that came into your life, the intruder and the intrusion that came into your life, sort of brought you something. Because the intruders bring fear, they bring anxiety, they even bring terror sometimes to our soul. Praise the Lord. When Jesus comes into our sheepfold, he brings us a different message. And that message is, peace be with you. That's how you can tell someone who's on the same spiritual plane with you. If your spirit bears witness with their spirit, praise God, that we are the sons and children of God, then you know that you're okay with this person. But when the yield sign goes up, and then when the red light goes on, that's a caution. You're going to find this in the employment area. And sometimes you're going to find it in your own families. People who do not understand your Christianity. Who do not understand how you love God. Who do not understand why you come to church on Sunday morning. You're going to have differences. Because they're going to intrude into your life. And they're going to try to persuade you that what you're doing is wrong. Trying to bring fear. Trying to bring guilt and condemnation on your life. God is trying to call us out. He's trying to call us out from the past. He's trying to call us out from present intruders and any harmful predators that would come to our sheepfold. And the sheepfold is here. It's in your heart. It's you. Romans 8.14 says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself bear witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. We know who we are. Philippians 4, 7 says this, And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So the first thing that can cause us to have an interruption in our relationship with Jesus is intrusion. It's the word trust. Because sometimes... As we don't trust people, sometimes we find ourselves not trusting God. Say ultra amen, because that's the truth. There's two problems. Number one, I have to ask you this question. Why is it difficult for some people to allow Jesus into their sheepfold? Why? It seems from a lack of trust and belief that God has our best interest in mind. Sometimes we don't think that God cares about us more than we care about ourselves. He created us. He's put us on a journey called life. 
We're walking through this world step by step. And as we said in previous sermons, the steps of a righteous man or woman are ordered by the Lord. But do we really believe that? Do we really accept that? Especially when adversity comes. Especially when sickness comes. Especially when calamity comes. Financial loss or whatever comes. Loss of our job comes. Do we really believe that Jesus Christ cares more about us than we do for ourselves? Hmm. See, a problem exists. Because lack of trust, we don't allow Jesus into the sheepfold, which is the heart and the inner man of a person. Praise God. We have a tendency, listen, to reject his coming because we equate him with what others have done to us negatively and hurtfully in the past to our lives. A lot of people have a hard time trusting God. The familiar example is maybe you had a father that wasn't very nice. Maybe quite abusive. And I've heard people tell me time after time through the ministry, it's hard for me to trust God as my father because of what my earthly father did to me. Well, perhaps a pastor hurt you, a fatherly figure, a, per a paternal figure. And you, and you come into a church and you say, well, I, I don't know if I can trust this man. I, I don't know if I can trust this leader. I don't know if I can trust this under shepherd. And I understand those feelings. Because I've had folks that have had to deal with those feelings. They're hard feelings to deal with. And we all have this. We're all suspicious. We seem like we're, we're, we're not trusting. And for good reason. Because many times we have been taken. Many times our, our, our meekness has been turned into weakness for some people. They think they could walk all over us. They think doormat is on our forehead. And it's not. We're Christians. We just love God. And we're so easily taken sometimes because we're the first ones to put our hand into our pocket. We're the first ones to give. We're the first ones to be generous. The Christian people are the first ones to reach out to someone that's in need. To reach out to the lost and the lonely and the hopeless and so on and so forth. And sometimes we get burnt. Sometimes we get bit. And we back up and we say, I'm not going in that frying pan anymore. We also do that with God sometimes. Listen to what I'm saying. As a result, we fear the entrance and the presence of Jesus in our lives sometimes. We don't trust him with the message. We don't trust him that he has our best interest in mind. He wants to bring to us, praise God. Others have disappointed us. But Jesus said in the familiar verse that I always speak of, I'll give you two versions. He says in Jeremiah 29 and 11, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. In the HCSB version it says, For I know the plans I have for you. Plans? God, you have plans for me? We don't believe that sometimes because we've been burnt. And we don't trust his plan for our life. And we go do our thing out of our own carnal nature. We think, I'm going to do what I think is best. And God says, it's not best. He says this, for I know the plans I have for you. This is the Lord's declaration. Plans for your welfare, not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. God is a God of hope. He's a God of hope. Even in this miserable world that we live in, wow. even in this world of chaos and violence and confusion and all of this that's going on, praise God, yeah. he still gives us as his children hope, like a parent will give a, a child hope. A, a child goes to school and, and, and someone is upsetting him or, or he's not doing that great or whatever it is in a particular subject, but mom and dad sit down with him and say, listen, I want to give you hope. I want to give you encouragement. And they sit down and help that child as best they know how to bring him out of that valley and out of that despair. And God does the same with us, praise God. Sometimes we get down low in that valley. And sometimes we begin to lose hope and encouragement. But God comes and he says, listen, I want to renew that plan in your life. I want to renew that plan. I want to renew your spirit. I want to refresh your life in the name of Jesus Christ. This is the God we serve this morning. Amen. Too many people are influenced and shaped by what they've been through. We park in the past. We park our car in the past. And nobody follows a parked car. Listen, 
They disregard what is written in Philippians 2.13. For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Amen. In the HCSB version it says, For it is God who is working in you, enabling you, both to will and to act for his good purpose. You know, sometimes when our car stops, and we're just sitting there, and thinking, where am I going? What am I doing? We start to minimize the greatness and the power of God in our life in terms of trusting him with the plan. And, and we so easily vacate from the plan. It's kind of like a, a football game. You know, there's always a game plan when you, when you go into a football game. And then most football teams are going to establish the run and then we're going to throw the ball. One is going to help the other. But a team gets down 14 to nothing. And all of a sudden you see them change their game plan. All of a sudden you see them, instead of running the football and loosening up the defense, they're throwing the ball. And before you know it, there's an interception. Because they didn't follow the game plan. They didn't follow what they finally said the night before. This is what we're doing. We all have a playbook. And everybody's giving the playbook. And today, this is the playbook for our team. Whether we're down 14-0 or 17-0 or 21-0, we're going to stick to the game plan. Amen. Amen. And sometimes we're down 14-0 as Christians. Amen. Sometimes we're down. But we've got to stick to the game plan. We've got to stick to the plan that God has outlined for our lives. Even when we don't see it in the visible, in the physical, it's there in the spiritual. And praise God, God wants to bring that to us. Hallelujah. Because he does have a plan for our life. So number one, trust. Sometimes we don't trust in God and his plan because of what others have done to us. Secondly, number two, sometimes we're independent and we're self-willed children. Mm -hmm. Oh, come on. I know that's sometimes hard to accept. <laughs> Just like Dr. Dobson wrote that book, The Strong-Willed Child. <laughs> a lot of us are strong-willed children. We're independent. And some people have had to survive to be independent in their life. They may have not had parents or they, whatever it may be, they, they've had to learn how to survive. And sometimes becoming independent is great. But it doesn't always work. Because you have to learn to become interdependent upon those that you can trust. Praise God. And not say, well, I, I don't know if I can do that. I, I've made it on my own thus far, so I've I got to continue. But that's not God's will. God's will is a body ministry. God's will is for us to be interdependent between each other and to love one another and to encourage one another. And sometimes to pull one another up. Sometimes out of the miry clay, praise God, with the help and presence of God. Sometimes we reject his coming because we insist on having our own way. Now, I know that doesn't apply to you. Just me. Come on now. I own it. We have to own it. I know we might laugh at it a little bit, but you know what? And I understand God understands my humanity. But one thing God does not understand is my disobedience. Yeah. Now, come on now. Yeah. It's just like a parent. God, a parent understands the humanity of his child. Okay? But a parent does not understand the disobedience of that child when he's willfully disobedient. Then there's a different frame of reference here. Now we're talking different. Now we're acting different as a parent. Now we're behaving different as a parent. And God is the same. He's a parent. He's Abba. He's Father. He's Daddy. And we get offended sometimes when we go off on our own way and we go do these things and God says, I'm not within a million miles of that. Hello. And sometimes, you know, we have to repent. Sometimes we have to repent. Sometimes we have to say, God, I'm sorry for what I did, what I purchased. It wasn't your will. I did it out of my own emotion. I remember one time I was mad at someone, really mad. <laughs> so I took my plastic card. I went down to Sears and I bought a rototill. Just because I was mad. 
I couldn't afford a rotatilla. A pirate. And you know what happened to that rotatilla eventually? It got stolen. Yeah. 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 And he was giving me a message. I never told you to buy that. You bought that out of anger. Mm -hmm. Boy, that's hard to swallow sometimes. That's hard to deal with. You bought that out of impulse and you bought that out of anger. Because you were mad at something. You're right. And it got stolen. It hurts when something gets stolen. But it was my fault. Praise God. I wasn't supposed to buy it in the first place. You have to repent. Amen? Sometimes we devise a plan and we ask God to bless it. Have you ever done that? Okay, God, this is what I'm going to do now. And God said, okay. Send me a memo. Send a carbon copy to someone else so they know what you're doing. Because what you're doing, I'm not part of. But you can do it. Because I'm a gentleman and I'm not going to stop you. And we say, okay, God, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And God says, go do it. You'll be back. You will be back. And we devise our own plan and we ask him to bless it. Well, he desires to show us his plan and what's best for us. Mm -hmm. See, this mind up here sometimes could become so carnal. Mm -hmm. What's the first thing you do when you run into some problems or situations? You get out the yellow pad, that's what they used to do, and, and you get a pen or a pencil and you write down 10 ways how I'm going to get out of this mess. How am I going to get out of this mess? You know, you're not talking to God. You're not praying. You're not fasting. You're not, you, you, you're not pushing the plate back and saying, okay, God, I've got myself in a mess. No, we got the yellow pen. And then we do worse than that. We go ask 10 other people. And what do those 10 people tell you? 10 different things. Then you're more confused now than you were. Now you're more confused. And now you're upside down. You're tipsy-tursy. We go, we, go, we go so far as to get others to agree with us, to make us look right. Aren't I doing the right thing? Tell me. Tell me I'm doing the right thing. And if you have a good friend, they're going to tell you, no, you're not doing the right thing. But if you have a lying person intruding into your life, they're going to say, they're going to just go to please you. Say, oh, okay, I'll please you. You're, you're doing the right thing. Don't want to go worry about it. <laughs> it doesn't work. You see, Isaiah pinned it very well. He said in Isaiah 53 and 6, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He paid for our sins. He paid for our disobedience. Romans chapter 8 verse 5 says this, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded, our plan, God bless my plan, Lord bless what I'm doing, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Listen, if you're doing something and it's not giving you peace, you need to have a check on that. Right. You need, you, need to, you need to do a, a bow face. You need to sit down in a chair and you need to say, say to God, how come I don't have peace about what I'm doing? Because there's no life if you don't have peace. Listen carefully what God is trying to bring to us. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. It's an enemy. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh. This is what God is saying to us through Paul the Apostle. But in the Spirit, if so be it that the Spirit of God dwell in you, now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. We're to be led by the Holy Spirit, especially in the day that we're living. It's no time for big mistakes. It's no time for big time decisions that God is not involved in. It's no time. I plead with you. God pleads with me. Sometimes I, 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 maybe I wait too long about making a decision about something. But I want to be sure that I know that I know that I know this is God speaking. I don't want to get burnt. I don't want to end up not trusting him. I don't want to end up doing my own thing. In the second verse in John chapter 10, it says, But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. 
What's that mean? The shepherd is the door of the sheepfold. The shepherd. The shepherd slept in the New Testament, Old Testament, at the opening and became the gate of the sheep. He slept in the entrance. In order to get to the sheep, you'd have to go over his body. You ever hear that saying? Over my dead body? Yeah, come on. That's right. Come on now. Try to get past the mother when you try to hurt her child. Right. You're a dead dog. Right. Try to get past the man when he's, someone's trying to hurt their family. You're a dead dog. We'll talk later. We'll answer questions later, but right now, you're a dead dog. We're the gatekeepers. We're the under shepherds. We're the moms. We're the dads. All the siblings of the gatekeepers for the younger siblings. Right. Hear what I'm saying. Understand what God is trying to bring to us as, 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 a, as a church this morning. Praise God. Jesus is our shepherd. And in order to get to his sheep, one would have to step over him, praise God, and get by him, which will not happen, praise God, because he bought us for the price and he owns us. Thank you, Lord. You try to hurt one of the children of God, it's like you're trying to get past the body of Jesus. You better be careful. And I, I, I tell people sometimes, and I, I've told this people in the prison system, be careful. If you don't understand some of these guys who are Christians, and I know they've done wrong things, and they're not saying that they haven't, but be careful how you treat them. You should be careful how you treat anybody. But be careful how you treat a child of God. I have to warn people sometimes and say, don't even touch it. Don't even go there. You can correct, but you don't have to do some things that you're trying to do. Right. It's uncalled for. You can be respectful. You can get your message across, and they will listen. And if they don't, we can write paper, and we can move on. And if they do get violent, then we have other methods, praise God, that are legal, that we, we can enforce. But be careful <laughs> how you treat a child of God. Jesus said it's better to tie a millstone around your neck than to be cast into the sea than to offend one of his children. I'm talking to you about the good shepherd this morning. You see, a, a lot of people think, well, the enemy has so much power over us that he can just bypass Jesus and get to us. No. No, the blood. Go back to the Old Testament, friends. Go back to the Old Testament. The blood's on the doorposts of our hearts. Praise God. Hallelujah. And nothing happens except by permission of our God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Nothing happens unless God says it's going to happen. Some people think that the enemy has full reign. He can do anything he wants. He had to ask permission from God to take the hedge away from Job. Come on, come on. And Job had no clue what was going on. But in the end, if you read the end of the story, God gave Job his wealth back. He gave him children. And if you do a study of his daughter's names that were born, they're very apropos for this day. I'll probably preach on that sometime in the future. As he restored, God restored him. Because God interrupted him and said, you, you can just go so far now. I gave him your permission. And I told you, he would not renounce me. He would not denounce me. That even if I slayed him, he'd still praise me and worship me. So the enemy lost that round. Oh, it was a big heavyweight championship fight. It went the distance, 15 rounds. But Jesus was there at the end. Amen. And Job had no clue, no clue of what was going on. But he trusted God. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. The Bible says the shepherd teaches us that the shepherd slept at the opening. Praise God. Jesus is our shepherd. In order for the enemy to get to us, he'd have to step over the body of Jesus Christ. Praise God. So this also refers to under shepherds. It refers to pastors, okay? Because God has placed under shepherds over his flock. Follow closely. They have lawful entrance into the door for ministering from the Lord and in turn to minister to God's people. Not all people that say they're ministers have lawful entrance into the door. And I'll get to that verse later that Jesus said, I am the door. Only those with lawful entrance, those that have been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, who have been called by God, 
can come into that door to be ministered by the Lord because the Bible talks about God died not only for our sins, but he gave the five offices of the church Amen. concerning the pastors, the teachers, the prophets, the evangelists, and so on and so forth, the apostles. Those are five offices that God died for, that he instituted in the church, praise the Lord, to cause the body of Christ to come together. Those who have lawful entrance will be ministered to by the Lord. And in turn, they will minister to God's people and to the flock. But the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, and the hirelings do not qualify for lawful entrance through the door of the sheepfold. And we have those even today. Yes. They're very cunning. Some are thieves and some are robbers. Some are very covert and some are very overt. They don't really care. They're doing their own thing, building their own kingdom, building their own name and so on and so forth and they have it right out there. Right out there. There's no left to the imagination. Handfuls on Purpose, which was a commentary, says this. Sheep have no means of defense. They have neither wings nor swiftness of foot. They flock together, but their numbers do not increase their strength. Their only safety lies in the power and carefulness of the shepherd. We are the sheep of his pasture and can be fed and de be defended by no one else. Live by faith, live by the faith of the Son of God. Paul said to the church at Galatia, in Galatians 2.20, he said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Psalm 23, 1 says, The Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want. Amen. Now let me just introduce this moment for a moment. As a pastor, as an under-shepherd of a church, you're always on guard to maintain the purity of the church. You're on guard for those that walk through the door. You're on guard until people prove themselves. You're on guard concerning conversation. Because why? Because God has put you in this lawful office of a pastor to defend the flock, to pray for the flock, to minister to the flock, to give the word to the flock, to give the Holy Spirit through the anointing of God to the flock. It's our job to do that. It's not, it's not just, this is my job and, 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 and I'm just going to preach and go home. It, there's more to this. Yeah. There's much more to this. This is a vocation and a dedication and sometimes it's a self-sacrifice concerning your family because you're away from them, because you hide yourself in the Lord and you spend many hours and times with the Lord to be ministered to by Him so you can minister to others. I can only bring you as far as I go in the Lord. And if I stop growing, you're going to stop growing. I don't want that. I don't want that. And it's a sacrifice at times because, yeah, we all want to kick our feet up. We all want to do this or do that. But God says, this is what you must do. Hours goes into just one sermon. Ministering. God speaking. God saying, put this, do this, look up this. And it's sometimes mind-boggling. And you think, well, how, how am I going to do all this? But you do it. Because he impels you to do it. He compels you to do it. So that the flock of God has a good meal, praise God, that can hang on to for the rest of the week. That's why we, we put it on YouTube. We put it on podcasts. I, I sent out your notes. I, I'm not ashamed of what I say or what I do. Amen. People want to check me, check me out. Check me out to see if I'm in the Bible, if I'm in the Word of God. I stay there. I want to stay there. The Bible says in verse 3 of John 10, To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. Now if you were rich and had a porter, and the porter would open the gate for the shepherd. But most people didn't have a porter. They didn't have a lot of money. Their sheep folds were just a bunch of brush, some sticks, some rocks that they built up as a wall to guard the sheep and to manage them at night. But listen to what this means. The porter opens the gate for what reason? So the shepherd can address the sheep. Listen to what the verse says. 
The porter opens the door, and the sheep hear his voice, and he called his own sheep by name and leadeth them out. So now it's the opportunity for the shepherd of the sheep to speak to the flock. And Jesus is our shepherd, and he wants to speak to the flock. The shepherd knows their name. Let's do what it says. He called his own sheep by name. When you think you're lost, when you think you're insignificant, when you feel that you're inferior, understand this one thing. God knows your name, and he knows where you live. Amen. Amen. Right. Thank you. You're not insignificant. You're not a piece of sand on the beach somewhere that some people refer themselves to. Who am I? The psalmist said, who am I that you're mindful of me? God says, you're my creation. And he says the same to us. When we get in the molly grubs, when we think nobody cares, nobody cares. Listen, God cares. If even if no one did care, he still cares. You know, I remember a missionary lady that I visited in, a, in a, an adult home. Her husband and her had been missionaries for decades and decades. Lovely, older woman. And I went to visit her. Had no family. And she set up her room. And she had her of spiritual things and so on. And I wondered how I would find her. Would she be content? Would she be discontent? Would she be clamorous? Would she be like hateful because of she's alone? I went in and I started talking to her, thinking I'm going to minister to her. She touched my life. Sweet woman. Not in one way angry with God. Not just thankful for what God had allowed her and her husband to do for decades and decades to minister to other people that were indigenous people. Content. Happy. And you look and you say, well, what does she have? She has a little room here with some, with a bed and a, and a chair and a table. And you would think, I went up there with that mind frame. But here's this woman, totally content in the Lord. Because the Lord was her shepherd. And she was thanking God for the opportunities that he gave her and her husband for decades to minister to other people. What's the shepherd saying? The shepherd is saying, listen and pay attention to what's being said. And we have to ask ourselves this question. Are we hearing what God is trying to say to us? We're so busy. We're so busy. We, we, we let time pass by. The Lord says, redeem the time. Time is important to us. Amen. Redeem it. Don't waste it. And we waste so much time on nonsense. And we waste a little bit of time on hearing the voice of God to what he's trying to speak to us. People say, well, when is, when is God speaking to us? Just hold on here for a minute. When the sheep hear the voice of the shepherd, everything and every other voice becomes insignificant. No cell phones. No electronics. Just shut up with God. No agenda. No schedule. This is the time that you've allotted with God to spend time with Him. To do one thing. To come into His presence and to hear His voice to tell you what the further plan is for your life. And when we don't take time to do that, you'll never figure it out. Right. You'll just go and do. And when we go and do, we mess up and we find ourselves in a mess. I want to address that here in a moment, okay? We should be giving up our interests and our demands to spend time with God. Listen, it's great to spend time with family and loved ones, and it's, it's, it's great to have time of recreation. And God is not saying to eliminate that. He's not saying that. He's saying, just give me some time. Just give me an opportunity in your life to speak to you. How, how would you feel if, if you were a parent and, and your kid didn't speak to you? Just went about living in your house and just went about his ways. And vice versa. How, how would you feel? You'd feel like, wow, I'm loved. Well, is God any different? He's a parent. He loves us. He's a father. And when we don't spend time with him, well, he must be thinking, Where's my children? 
Because the Bible says he, he looks to and fro throughout the, the face of the earth for someone to stand in the gap. For right. someone to sit down and speak to him. He wants fellowship. Why did he create Adam and Eve? Did he need people? No. He was God. He had it all. But he created man. He fellowshiped with man. He broke bread with man. Come on. When Jesus rose from the dead, we celebrate Easter time. He's on the seashore, and then the Peter backslid and is fishing out there with the disciples. And he yells out to them. He says, children, children. He calls them children. Do you have any bread? Do you have any meat? Excuse me. Peter says, that, that's the Lord. He puts his clothes on. And they go to shore. I mean, what, what did Jesus have? The coals of fire, the, the, the bread, the, the fish. He wants to bring bread with us. But when we're in such a hurry, oh, I got things to do. I'm too busy. <laughs> okay. And when we're too busy for God, folks, we're too busy for God. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. We must give up our agenda. Sometimes sheep go blah. Blah. What does that mean? They're not paying attention. That's right. Be quiet. Stop going blah when the shepherd is speaking to you. Right. Have you ever noticed sometimes you can't get an edge, a word in edgewise with some people because they're always going blah. That's right. Talking a mile a minute. And you got to tell them stop. Before I call the sheriff and arrest you, Billy. Because you're just talking too much. And you're not listening. You ever see when a kid starts to defend himself? Two kids are in the room, one comes out with a bloody head. How did that happen? I don't know. You got a truck in your hand with blood on it. He's got a skull that's open. I don't know. And they argue with you. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. You got the truck with the blood in your hand. He's got a broken head. <laughs> Who did it? I didn't do it. And they want to argue with you and tell you, finally tell them, stop. Stop. You're guilty. You did it. Because there's no one else in this room but you and your brother. And he didn't hit himself on the head and give himself a fraction. Sometimes you got to tell people to be quiet. Because they're bothered too much. When you hear this message in your heart, you're blonde. When, you, when God speaks to you and you speak to yourself and you say, I ought to do that. I should have done that. You hear what I'm saying? Amen. When you hear that message in your heart, then you went blah. Because you didn't do what God said for you to do. Mm. And sometimes it's an inconvenience. Sometimes you just don't feel like doing it. Sometimes you don't feel like getting out of your convenient schedule and saying, oh, I got things to do and I've got this and that. And God says, you know what? I've got this for you to do. Right. Because there's someone here that needs comfort. And you could be in a turmoil at that moment. You could be in one of the baddest trials of your life and God calls you. And so many times as he does, he does this. When you're in a very bad spot, he called you to go minister to someone else. And you say, Lord, you got such a sense of humor. Don't you know how I feel? He said, I do. But I can make you stay there and you can gloat and block. Or I can give you an assignment. Hmm. It's like when a kid starts complaining. Tell him to take out the garbage. Tell him to go rake the leaves. You want to complain? Go out there, complain all you want. But in the meantime, rake those leaves for your dad. Well, if I rake those leaves, you know I'm going to be in school right now. I don't care. One thing doesn't have to do with the other. Right. It's kind of like sometimes, you know, dealing with depression, and I'm not trying to minimize depression. I've dealt with some folks through the years, and they got a, a, a stack of dishes in the sink that they, they haven't done, and the vacuuming they haven't done in weeks, and they say, I'm depressed. I said, okay. Stay depressed, but go do those dishes in the sink. Right. Go something. That's right. And turn on the vacuum and stay depressed if that's what you want to do. Stay depressed. And just and, and go back in. At least you're going to get your house clean and your dishes done. Because you're going to be eating on cardboard here in a few days. And it's no fun eating on cardboard, especially when you have a taco or you have spaghetti and something hot. It's going to burn right through the cardboard. It's true, that's right. Is that an assignment? That's a homework assignment. Feel sorry for yourself? Go ahead. 
But the dishes are so high, they're almost to the ceiling. It's like the Leaning Tower of Dishes. Ooh, gonna go away. Mm, let me continue here. What did Jesus say? He said in Matthew 7, 24, Yes, therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, do we really hear them? And do with them, I will liken him to a wise man which built his house upon the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not. For it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine, do with them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. You know what the word fall means? Collapsed. And a lot of people's houses are going to collapse in the last day. Because they're not obeying the word of God. They'll go into apostasy. They'll stop trusting God. They'll reject his coming into their sheepfold. And they'll say, well, I, I can't do this no more because I've tried to trust him and it's not been working out for me. How do we hear the shepherd's voice? Through reading, through studying his word, through preaching, Amen. through the still, the still small voice that speaks to our heart. And believe it or not, through his creation. You know, some people say, well, how are the people, indigenous people in the jungles of Africa somewhere, who have never heard the gospel, have never heard a preacher, how, how are they going to be saved? Well, read the book of Romans, chapter 1. They'll know there's a God by, by the, the sun and the sky, by the moon, by the animals, by the trees and the plants and the vegetation, and all that things that, that happen. They'll say, someone had to do that. And they'll be judged on a different level. The Bible says in Psalm 19 and 1, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night he showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out to all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he set a tabernacle for the sun. You know what God said? I can speak and praise God when people see the trees, and they see a lion or a tiger. When they see the moon come, or the sun rise, or the sun and said, they'll know there's a God. Yes. They may not have a Bible. They may not have a preacher. They may not even have, haven't even heard the name Jesus. But those people will be found in glory because they accepted that there was one greater than them Amen. who created this earth. And they'll be judged on that basis. Amen. Praise God. We are gatekeepers, my friends. As brothers and sisters in Christ, whether a parent, a friend, or a pastor, we are watchmen for each, praise God, especially for our children. We are watchmen for each other. We must help one another from being deceived and swallowed up by the evil of this world. We must watch out for the thieves and robbers in each of our lives. Right. And sometimes warn people and say, listen, this is not right. Something doesn't click here. John chapter 10, verse 3. And he called his own sheep by name and leadeth them out. The shepherd knows all about us. He leads us out. Of what? He leads us out of our past, where some people have parked their car for decades. Praise God. He calls us out so we can follow him. He's our way out of the past, out of the miry clay. You cannot unscramble the egg. That's right. Some people are trying to unscramble the egg. Sure. Who wants to scramble the scramble? It won't go past, right? <laughs> My wife makes me scrambled eggs dry. I, I eat them. You, you can't put that back in the shell. Right. It's uh, yolk of done. Nothing. People sit down day after day, week after week, year after year, decade after decade, trying to unscramble the egg. Coulda, woulda, shoulda. Gotta stop. Gotta hear the new message. Gotta get the new song. Gotta get the new scripture. You gotta get that record play and break the needle and say, praise God, it's not playing anymore for me. I don't want to hear that music. And that's what the music they play in their ear day in and day out. And oh God, feel sorry for me. No, I will not. Amen. <coughs> Gets us nowhere. That's right. We can give empathy at times and sympathy and God expects that. But he also expects us to get up off our duff and say, you know what? I gotta brush myself off. Listen, every one of us has been in a fight and some of those I lost. Come on. Come on. I won some, but I lost some. Yep. What do you do? You brush yourself off and you say, you know what? Heal up. Better That's next right. day. That's right. Amen. Nobody bowls 300 every game. No, no pitcher purchases, pitches a perfect game. Listen, we all fail. 
We all fall. We all come short. But sometimes you got to just dust yourself off and say, you know what? I'm going forward. I can't go backwards. Man, I don't want to go back to that mess that I was in. Listen carefully what God is trying to say. Hallelujah. Jesus, he calls us. He says, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospers. He, he maps out a map for us to plan and guide us on our journey. And praise God. But listen to this. He not only calls us to speak to us, he wants to lead us out of the sheepfold. Amen. Why? Because in the sheepfold, there's a buildup of dirt, debris, and dung. And you know what dung is. You get all those sheep in one area enclosed, and they might have had blueberries that day. Good <laughs> pancakes, but not so much. On the... <laughs> and you might be hearing a whole lot of noises, like you do in your house sometimes when the kids do that and they laugh, and it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> kids go crazy and they laugh like crazy. You did that when you were a kid. Come on. I used to make the noises so they didn't. Stop that! <laughs> Where's your manners? Where were your manners when you were a kid? And you did that with your sister and your brother? They see who could do it loudest. Come on now. Are you serious? We act like we're so sanctimonious and so holy sometimes. Like we never, never had a childhood. Really? We all had a childhood. Amen. And man, if you took a little of that childhood, some people would say, no, I can't believe you did that. Really? I can't believe you lived through that. What do you think? I'm saintly? That's why I needed a savior, because I was a sinner. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. I mean, one time my brother got a new watch. Like uh, during this time for Easter. Oh, no. <laughs> you know when you had to wind it up? Yep. Too far. I took the watch. <laughs> and I wound it up too far. <laughs> And I broke the stem. I put it in the drawer and I hid it. Where's the watch? Oh. Where's the watch? <laughs> My brother got a new watch. Where's the watch? What, what, what'd you do with the watch? I don't know. I can't find the watch. He couldn't find the watch because I took the watch. How could he find the watch that he didn't have? That wasn't a pleasant time. <laughs> when you had to own up that you broke your brother's watch because you cranked it up too far. You know, one time we had a television, you know? There was no remotes in those days. Big television. Beautiful. One of the newer models. And I decided one day that I was going to sort of like do some flips on it. I did. And you know the tuner, you know? The thing that stuck out? Television comes on the floor. Beep! Smashes right up there. <laughs> Woo! Hard to pull that out. Wow, that was a tough time, too. Yeah. <laughs> I had some tough times when I was a kid. I had some tough times when I was a kid. What was I thinking? I wasn't thinking. My mom and dad helped me to think better. Sometimes you get yourself in a mess because the sheepfold begins to smell and it becomes odor, offensive odors and we're standing in our own mess and what it represents this, Jesus is trying to get us out of ourselves and free us from our restrictive lives that we sometimes live in. Amen. We're like in a box and I only do things this way. I'm a chicken, and I don't get plucked no other way but this way. Okay. <laughs> there are ways of doing that. <laughs> but that still don't you dare pluck me any other way. Oh, my. <laughs> and we're in that sheepfold, and we're here. <laughs> and the sheep are looking at one another, and they're wondering, it's, I can't stand it in here anymore. <laughs> Because God is trying to get us away from our cramped and our contaminated life. We become soiled sometimes and we mess our pants as human beings in that barren land. And sometimes we get in a mess that we create ourselves and we cry out, How do I get out of this mess, God? That's right. Gracious. And what a gracious God we have. Amen. 
he comes. You know, kind of like with the spiritual pooper scooper. <laughs> yeah. He comes into your sheepfold. And he says, excuse me, could you stand over there for a moment while I clean up your mess? Bedding down. And he, he just scoops it all up. And you're looking at him, you're saying, why? You, you're cleaning me up here, aren't you? Yeah, you, you made quite a mess. <laughs> you, you made quite a mess. Yeah, really. And you wonder, and you look at him, you say, why are you doing this? Because I love you. Because I really love you. And you just not have gotten that message yet. I really do love you. Praise God. Hallelujah. What's God trying to say to us? He's saying in John chapter 10 and verse 9, he says, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and he shall go in and out and find pasture. Let me just stop here for a moment and say these words to you. The shepherd does not allow the sheep to linger in the barren land too long. You know, you might get mad at somebody because you're in the valley of despair and somebody comes and knocks on your door and says, come on. I don't want to. Come on. You are going out and we're having coffee and lunch. I don't want to. Shut up. Get dressed because I'll handcuff you. You're going to want to. Let's do it. I'll handcuff you. And you'll come. And sometimes we refuse to get out of our mess because we think it's the end. Oh, it's the end. As the Jewish people will say, I'm kaput. No, you're not kaput. He wants to put you back together. Yes, Lord. Come on. You're going to you. That's what he wants to do. But we want to sit in our mess sometimes. We want to stew in it. We want to get despair. We want to have that face on us. That would scare an angel away. A real one. My mother used to call it the puss. Yeah, there you go. That's where the puss. Come here. Get rid of that. Let me close. The shepherd wants to lead us out of the barren land, which are dead end situations. Listen, you might be in a dead end this morning. You might have screwed up. You might have done something or whatever that God wasn't within a million miles away. He puts sheep out early because there are more hours in the day to accomplish and bring encouragement to the soul. What's God saying? Don't sleep all day. Amen. Some people can sleep all day. I don't know how people can sleep all day. I have no clue. Man, if I'm out up early in the morning, I feel like I've cheated myself, God, and the whole world. Yep. I know we need sleep, but man, some people get up 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Daylight's burning. And then, well, what, what did you do? Oh, I had a rough night last night. What did you do? Oh, I watched the late show. <laughs> watched the late show. That's hard. <laughs> that's rough. How about doing something that's productive? Many resist Jesus, who desires to lead them out of their rut or misery because they haven't truly heard the words of Jesus. The thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But Jesus said, I am come that you might have life and might have it more abundantly. Can I have a few more moments? John 10, 4. He put forth his own sheep. He go before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Sheep begin enjoying the voice of the shepherd because they know that the shepherd is going to bring them to good food and water. And the shepherd is going to protect them from predators. They enjoy hearing. Jesus says, follow me, which means to join him as an attendant, accompany him, and become one of his disciples. Follow means to not drag behind. Don't drag behind. Move with a purpose. John chapter, uh, the Bible says in Revelation 1.15, And his feet like unto fine brass as they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. Revelation 19 and 6, John said, And I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. It's the voice of God. It's the voice of many waters that wants to come into our life and quell every storm. Go sit by a brook or a creek or a lake. You don't have to swim. Listen to that water. Just go sit there. That's right. And just listen. Just listen. It's soothing. It's peaceful. 
It does something for your soul. John chapter 10, verse 5 says this, And a stranger they will not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. We teach our children, stranger danger. God is trying to teach us as his children, stranger danger. He tries to save us from the thief and from the robber. Our lifestyle is an indication of who we really are. Our lifestyle. A true disciple will not follow the wrong crowd. You'll separate yourself. Your sheepfold will separate from the world. Praise God. A true disciple will separate from evil rather than be destroyed by that evil. Don't linger around those thieves who want to pollute you with immoral behavior or false doctrine that will taint your life and your soul and separate you from the truth. Those are the thieves and robbers that the shepherd, Jesus, wants to keep you from. He says he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And a lot of people don't believe that. Colossians 2.8 says this, Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. I have no time to argue with people about their philosophical, theological nonsense. I have no time. I see people put stuff on the internet. It's nice. It's nice sayings, but it's not biblical. It's not biblical. It's new age. That's right. It's new age. And people just grasp onto that like it's gospel. No, it's vain philosophy. It's, it's deceit. It's a thief and a robber that comes in a packaged way. You know, with flowers or a picture or trees or, or the sunset or the sunrise. No, not for me. That's right. Don't like it. Don't want it. Don't bring it to my house. Praise God. Hallelujah. The Bible says in Matthew 7, 15, Be aware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Did you read that? You, you shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs or thistles? Even so every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire, whereby their fruits you shall know them. We're supposed to be fruit inspectors. I love these people who go around saying, we're not supposed to judge. Really? Every time you pass a gas station, you're judging. Yeah. <laughs> you're judging a cheaper price. Yeah. Every time you go to the market and you're looking at meat and you're saying, hmm, 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 which one? You're judging. Don't tell. The Bible says to judge from within. That's right. He says that in Corinthians. Read it for yourself. Mm-hmm. And sanctimonious Christians go, oh, we're not supposed to judge one another. You shall know them by their fruits. Right. And if it's an evil tree, it's not bringing forth good fruit. Judge it. Unless you want to take a bite of it mm-hmm. and end up like Eve and Adam. Correct. That's right. And I don't want that. And sometimes you have to be painfully plain with people. Just don't bring that to me. I don't want to even know about it. Yeah. Right. Sometimes you might be hearing a sermon on radio or some preacher that you've turned into thinking maybe it's going to be something good, but in your spirit, all of a sudden, you said to yourself, you know what? I, this yeah, is yeah. not clicking. And you're not even trying to find out why. Yeah. You're not even trying to find out why. You just know that, you know what? I, I, I don't need to. The, you know, curiosity killed the cat. That's right. And I don't want to be the cat that dies because of curiosity. You know, you know what I'm saying? And you say to yourself, you know what? I, I don't need that. It's just ver- verbal vomit. Praise God. Let me close. Here's God's promise. I want you to get this. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. Psalm 23, 2. But I coupled that with this verse, John 10 and 9, and I saved it for this part. I'm the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Jesus said that. There was only one door in the ark. There was only one door. There wasn't a philo- philosophical door. There wasn't a theological door. There wasn't a, a this door and that door. There was only, only one door that the animals went through and, and Noah's family went through. And when God said close that door, the door was closed. <clears throat> People had a chance. 120 years. Come on, guys. Sure. This world's had a chance. Yeah. Mm-hmm. This, this world has really had a chance. I mean, if you look at the state, and even our own country, uh, on what we're doing to people, what we're doing to one another, how we're masking people, how, how gangs are hurting people, how, how, what we're doing to children, human trafficking, it's, it's unbelievable. 
you would think that God would say, you know what? And it's going to come one day if we're not careful. After 120 years, after 120 years, Noah pleaded with them. Pleaded with them. They wouldn't. Just like Jesus did when he looked over Jerusalem and he cried. And he said, if you would have known who was here right now, you would come to me. But you don't. And it's the same today. People want to stay dead, dried up. They want to have dead churches, dead preachers, whatever. Listen, I, I heard a, a Presbyterian lady minister the other day. They played it on, the, on the, this news program. Referring to God as the rainbow God. Hmm. Referring to God's children as the, him, he, it. And, and listening to this, these guys, are, and, and these guys were schooled in the Bible, even though they, they were just news people on this program. And they said, can you believe this? The church has gone woke. Yeah. Right. The church has gone woke. Yeah. We have preachers that have gone woke. They, what are we doing? What happened to the gospel? He made male and female. Mm -hmm. How much plainer can we get? Amen. Why are we doing this to children? Why are we teaching children nonsense? Why? Because we're a polluted society with polluted minds who think they know best and they know better than God. Listen, you put your boxing gloves on with God and you're going to end on the deck somewhere. Right. It's abomination. Right. And I stagger at the thought sometimes and I say, God, how can you just not judge us? Because he's long-suffering, wishing that no one would perish. But there's going to come a day when the door is going to close. I don't want that door to close on me. I don't want to be on the outside. I want to be on the inside of that arm. What does the word door mean? It means to save us from sin, of course. To make us whole. To heal and make well. It means to restore to health. To keep safe and sound. To rescue and preserve. Closing. Jesus is the door that separates us from the enemy of our soul. He's our security. And he's our protective covering. He nourishes us and he brings spiritual vitality to our soul. When we're tired, when we're sick, and seemingly can't find our way in life, he's there beckoning, beckoning us to come through the door so he can minister to us. He's saying, come, just come, come, just come. And he knows the state you're in. He knows. You don't even have to explain to him. He knows your body your soul, your spirit, every cell, every artery, every fiber, everything about you, he created, your DNA, everything. Amen. And I believe it's time that God says to us to come through that door for healing. A body, soul, and spirit. I don't know about you, but I hear more and more people are just decimated with disease and illness. And it brings tears to me. It upsets me. It, uh, it upsets me. Because I know the enemy just wants to kill people. Steal from them. Premature death. And not give them a, a life that God said they could have. I take it personal. I take it personal. And we should take it personal. And we should all walk through that door and pray, not only for ourselves and for our families, but for those that are struggling, that are too weak to pray, that are tired. I understand that. I get it. I understand. I saw my dad. I understand. You get so tired that you just say, what's the point? But God wants us to fight. He wants us to fight for one another because we are each other's gatekeepers. And if I can make this analogy and not step outside of God, he's the shepherd that sleeps at the gate of the sheepfold. But he's assigned each one of us to be under shepherds, brothers, sisters, watchmen, parents, whatever, to sleep at the sheepfold of each other and to guard our houses and our body, soul, and spirit and to help each other, praise God, and to bring each other out of that pen when we mess up because you can't stay in there too long without soiling. To go into the green pasture, and he's that door. And he said, if you come through this door, you shall go in and out and find pasture for your soul. Let us pray. Father, 
I said this prayer out not only for the church here and for the people and for the families that are associated with this church, but God, I send this prayer out for those that might listen or view this sermon. I pray, God, in the name of Jesus Christ, that, God, you would obliterate cancer, that you would obliterate every disease that's so debilitating in people's lives, especially those that love you and care about you, God. Those that are backslidden, those that you're trying to call back, I pray, God, that you will loose that spirit. It's a spirit in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And loose it from them, whatever that disease or sickness may be. I ask, God, that you loose it this morning in the name of Jesus. And I ask, dear God in heaven, that you would bind the power of healing upon their body, soul, and spirit. Upon the minds of those that are suffering from emotional illness, from mental illness, from those that have lost their way, I pray that you would bind your spirit of healing upon their body, soul, and spirit. As the Bible declares that our whole body, soul, and spirit be sanctified wholly through him, through him who is Jesus Christ, the great geek, uh, gatekeeper, the great shepherd of our soul, the great bishop of our soul. I pray to heal, Father, this morning that you would heal. Heal, God, through the blood, through the name of our precious Savior. Jesus Christ, we pray, and the church said, Amen. Amen. God bless you, and thank you for coming this morning.